third phase of Moon. Back to third phase of Moon Radio. I'm your host, Dr. J, and we have an amazing show for you today. Of course, back by popular demand is Dr. Stephen Greer. But before we bring him on, let's bring in the founder, Third Phase of Moon, Blake Cousins. Blake, how you doing today? Doing good this afternoon, Dr. J. Um, wow, we're going about to get uh, Mr. Back on Third Phase. His uh, incredible documentary premiered a few months back. We have the link where you could actually watch the video. The DVD itself, we're posting it on this uh, on our YouTube channel when we post this uh, on here. The Dr. Greer has been working for years trying to get disclosure. The Serious Disclosure Project is uh, world-renowned. People are following Dr. Greer in his mission to find out about free energy. It, are we alone in this universe, this Atacama uh, humanoid, what he calls it? Uh, we're not exactly sure what it is. Um, we're hoping Dr. Greer has more information on that. And also, I wanted to tell everybody, if you're looking for breaking news UFO videos, we just released one uh, yesterday in regard to the International Space Station of what looks to be some kind of massive ship, uh, you know, visiting the ISS. I suggest that everybody go to Third Phase Moon YouTube, check out the videos, listen to this incredible interview that we're going to have right here at Third Phase of Moon, coming up in just a few seconds. Is he, uh, do we got Dr. Greer on the line yet, Dr. J? We are getting him as we speak. If everybody's ready, we are bringing him on right this second. As everybody knows, he did the Disclosure Project over 12 years ago, and now he's doing serious disclosure, and he is the leading expert around the world teaching people how to make contact for themselves since the government really will not disclose for that matter. And with that being said, we do have Dr. Stephen Greer on the line. Dr. Greer, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, it's always an honor. you know. And for that matter, Blake was just talking about the Atacama, uh, ET we like to call it, uh, and he actually had an amazing question for you, and I'm going to go ahead and give it to him to ask it real quick. Yeah, sure. Dr. Greer, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, you know, it's just it's, since you've come forward, uh, our, the Third Phase of Moon listeners were very fascinated with your uh, documentary, the, the Sirius, and what was in, inside that documentary was this incredible Atacama humanoid, which you uh, named it. And what the people on Third Phase of Moon want to know is if you've had any more analysis done of what's up with this humanoid. I know it didn't quite match. It slightly matched DNA, human DNA, but it, what else has come up since uh, more study on the Atacama humanoid? Well, I think it's not correct to say it matched human DNA because you have to understand it only matched our genetic uh, material 91%, uh, and, in, of course, a chimpanzee is 98.5%, and nobody would call a chimpanzee human. Um, so the problem is, is that um, the uh, in the movie uh, at the time that we cut the movie about a year ago, um, the Stanford geneticist and that team uh, had done uh, three runs of the genetic material uh, from the rib uh, that we clipped off of the right rib of this little creature. Uh, and run it against uh, using the best techniques in the world at the best reference labs in the world. Now, those reference labs use 2,500 um, ethnic human um, genotypes or the genetic uh, coding for 2,500 ethnicities around the world, huge number. And it, there was not a match. And um, the 9% that did not match is a very high number for it to be an error because of the quality of the sample, which was bone marrow, and the fact that it was run under the most stringent conditions uh, at the most prestigious academic institution in the world um, that does this kind of work at Stanford University. So the question became, what is in that 9%? Now, what's, what we've started doing since then um, is to look at that material now, you have to do this by hand. You can't just run that through automated computerized algorithms. Uh, and what they're finding is, well, at the time we made finished the movie, it was thought that this was a male. Now it's not clear that it has a gender that we can identify at all. Number two, the stature, uh, and this is what's mind-blowing. As you know, Dr. Ralph Lockman at Stanford, who wrote the textbook on... Um, uh, skeletal deformities in children and uh, birth defects 
uh, has ruled this out as anything uh, known in the medical literature, but also that studying the skeletal, uh, what are called the epiphyseal plates, has concluded that it's a six-year-old, um, a six- to eight-year-old, depending on what gender it is, um, if it has a gender. And, but it's only six inches tall. So imagine a six- to eight-year-old child only being six inches tall. Well, this, again, throws, you know, of course, on the Huffington Post, you had this guy, Joel Stein, and some other people say, oh, well, because it has some genetic material that's similar to humans, it's a deformed human. Now, in, in his defense, this is the only thing the Stanford scientists can say. They, they don't have a database of ETs uh, that we have in classified projects that we, you know, retreat from shooting down with electromagnetic weapons, uh, ET craft, over the last 60 years since Roswell. But what they, what they do have is the, the human genome very well mapped, and this is not matching. But clinically, it's not matching because there's no known syndrome that, that explains 10 ribs and explains a six-year-old being six inches tall. Now, they didn't know what caused this very short stature because, you know, aside from the fact that the skull was very different from a human and there were only 10 ribs instead of 12, and by the way, there are no syndromes in humans that have 10 ribs, and it's very symmetric. It's not like a deformed, you know, when you see a deformed fetus, there are obvious deformities, medically speaking. You know, I've, unfortunately, as an emergency doctor, delivered some of these that are badly deformed and don't survive. But I certainly never have delivered something that's only six inches long and lives to be six years of age. Even in our in intensive care units at the best hospital in the world today, you cannot keep such a, a, a child alive. And so this begs the question, what is this? And, and so suddenly, you know, they start digging down on the genes that normally cause what's called dwarfism, which is very short stature. Um, and none of the genes that are known in any of the dwarf syndromes of any one ever on Earth is, is found in this specimen. So they looked specifically for that. So then they started looking at other genes that control for height. And they have found, and this is the big news that's just happened in the last month or two, they have found genes that control for the stature, and I'm quoting from the geneticist at Stanford, um, uh, Dr. Nolan, who state, stated to me uh, that it, the chances that this is a uh, mutation, meaning it's just a deform, de deformation due to some kind of one-off uh, isolated mutation, is, and I'm quoting here, infinitesimally small meaning that it almost certainly is not just a deformed human. Now, that is a huge breakthrough. Now, the question then becomes, well, what is it? Well, we can't say what it is yet because uh, we, there's no provenance saying that this came from a species from another star system. Um, now, there are associated clinical or field research findings that we found that this little being, and people who are curious about this, they can go to SiriusDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S, Disclosure.com, and see all the x-rays and MRI scans and um, reports from Dr. Lockman, et cetera. Um, and also the film is still there. You can see the video on demand, and soon we're going to make it so that you can download to own it so you don't have to actually get the DVD, but you can get the DVD of the film. And in all that research that was done, what they found, what we found in the aftermath, when this got released, <laughs> there are these things that have been reported all over the world. There was one in Russia from the 1996. It looks very similar to this. That was about a foot tall, but was apparently a fully grown adult. And there are reports of others of these that are down in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is the driest place in the world. Now, I talked to one researcher who had gone back down there when this specimen first surfaced in 2004, between 2004 and 2014, I'm not sure what dates, he had gone down there and found that, in fact, there were reports of luminous objects that would uh, go into the foothills of the Andes, sort of dematerialize and go into the earth, and that there are other reports that when they started mining in that area in the 1800s and early 1900s, they would, they would cut into uh, some earthen areas that would have like small little underground cities that would be to the size of these uh, life forms. 
So the question becomes, uh, you know, is there more to be found on this? And the answer is probably yes. Now, we're wanting to do a follow-up um, uh, sort of research on this and then come out with a second uh, documentary that focuses just on this whole mysterious uh, Atacama humanoid phenomenon because what we have found is there's much more to this story than the public has heard yet and that we're just still learning. Uh, and uh, the, the, the most fascinating part of it is that if there's more than one of these, all the scientists that are working on this have said that then it's case closed. If there's more than one, you're dealing with a totally different species. Right now, nobody can state that certainty. Um, but uh, I have to point out also that you know Neanderthals, which are a separate species from Homo sapiens or humans, is 99.5% genetically identical to modern Homo sapiens. Uh, and gorillas are 98.5 or 98.7% identical to humans. And therefore, this only being 91% matching, and there are all these other clinical anomalies, uh, it certainly doesn't uh, look like anything that we can say is just uh, a one-off deformed human. And now that they've found a gene that looks like a normal uh, gene and not something that's the result of a mutation, because they can tell that by looking at it, um, this then begins to bring up the question, are there more of these? Has there been a civilization um, from elsewhere that has been on the planet for a very, very long time? And are these accounts that you, uh, you know, I was in New York giving a talk about a month ago, and a man who has a home in Ireland says, you know, this reminds me of the, the stories of the wee people, the, small, the wee ones, the little ones in Ireland and other places where people have reported. And, of course, a lot of these things become mythology or mythologized, I should say. But maybe those myths are based, based in something that people have actually seen that uh, is evidence of a, another species of, of humanoid-like uh, uh, creatures. So that's, that's the intriguing question in all of this. I tend to agree with you there that, uh, you know, the, first of all, the fact that this is a 9% difference, whereas chimps and, and gorillas are 98 to 99.5% uh, similar to us, where this is a bipedal as well. Uh, obviously, this could be the smoking gun. And like you said, if it matches another uh another being that's very similar, then obviously there's a race. At the same time, though, you still got those skeptics out there who will, no matter what, at all costs, deny the, the fact that this could be another creature from another planet. And we were speaking well, about... Dis- you know, that's always going to happen. You know, Ex- exactly. And we were speaking about disclosure. We fear that it's possibly never going to happen in the sense that the President of the United States is going to step forward. And, and therefore, that's why your initiatives of CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, where you're teaching people how to make contact for themselves, is the way to go. Can you tell us what led you to get there? Yeah, well, you know, the whole question, you know, I always laugh because, you know, I'm the founder of the Worldwide Disclosure Movement, um, and the 2001 National Press Club event uh, kicked that off, uh, and uh, now we have over 500 military and corporate and intelligence witnesses who come forward. On our website, we have like five or six dozen of these people's testimonies up there for anyone who wants to look at them to see, and also on our YouTube channel. So all this is out there, and yet people still say, well, you know, when is disclosure going to happen? And what I always answer is, you don't get it. I went from 1993 until 2001 personally briefing the president's men, as it were, all the president's men and the CIA director and the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency and the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, members of the royal families in Europe, and else and on and on and on. I'm not going to belabor my bona fides. The point is is that those folks, if they knew at all, and most of them do not, um, if they knew at all, were afraid to step forward uh, after uh, former CIA director Bill Colby was going to help us with this and was uh, assassinated, and they found his body floating down the Potomac River back in the uh, mid to late 90s, I believe it was 96 or something like that. And so I think that the people who are in these covert programs are afraid to come forward with actionable intelligence that's current, and the people who are your normal political class that get elected and come and go in office are people who, to be honest with you, almost never are briefed on this in any real detail. And even if they are briefed, 
we have to make the distinction between them knowing about the issue and having access control. And by access control, I mean they're actually able to order through the chain of command for something to be done, and it will be done. In more likelihood, what happens, if you look at the film Sirius, we go through this at some length about what an unacknowledged special access project is. And I got introduced to these back about 20 uh, years ago, and uh, some military advisors I had who had been in these projects said, look, this is how this works. You know, we have 100 to $200 billion a year being, uh, frankly, embezzled out of the coffers of the United States that go into ultra-super black projects, not ordinary black, but the really deep black uh, national security super state. And the people who are in these unacknowledged special access projects, which we call USAPs, are ordered that even if the commander-in-chief asks them about that, or even if their commanding general ask them about what they're doing. They are to respond, uh, I'm not doing anything, this project doesn't exist. Now, one of my military advisors was in a project that was two or three billion dollars uh, back, way back in the, I believe it was uh, the, the 70s or 80s, that was one unacknowledged special access project, one of them that was that much. Uh, and there are many of them that are running inside uh, covert programs at, uh, through the corporate world mainly at Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, uh, Booz Allen, Hamilton, uh, SAIC, Raytheon, E-Systems, uh, MITRE Corporation, EGNG, et cetera. So what happens is that the public very mistakenly thinks that the President of the United States or the UN Secretary General or the Prime Minister of England, or for that matter, the Queen of England, is going to be able to stand up and say, here's this, this, and this, and this. And the, the reality is those folks often don't know much or anything about it. And to the extent that they do know about it, they're terrified about acknowledging it, not because they think the public's going to freak out, but because they don't want to admit that they don't have control over these projects. And what Eisenhower said when he said, but we're the military-industrial complex because it will be a threat to our democracy and way of life, this is what he was talking about. So. You know, what I tried to do in the 90s was to encourage these leaders to do the right thing and, and frankly, force the issue and get these projects under control. None of them wanted to do it because of the risks involved. And therefore, I concluded in 2001 that the disclosure would need to be done by we the people. And if the people will lead, eventually the leaders will follow. And that's really where it rests. It rests with us now. And the biggest, there's two ways of doing that, having more insiders come forward and telling the truth with actionable intelligence, as they call it, in documents, information, specific details. The other is for people to go out and endeavor to make contact with these civilizations directly, bypassing the whole stranglehold that the uh, secret government programs have on this because the truth is, uh, and this is, I remember meeting with the head of Army Intelligence years ago and a couple guys from the National Security Agency and CIA who were very, uh, frankly, pissed off uh, that, that I was doing this, is that I was training people how to use consciousness and a set of protocols to go out to areas and make contact and these objects were appearing. I mean, you know, I mean, this has been going on now in our project for 22, 23 years. And they were very disturbed by this because they knew that this is sort of the Rosetta Stone of contact, but it's also the, the, the main way that this could get out of their control because if people took this under their own hands and started directly doing protocols that were effective to make contact, they can't, maybe they can monitor me and a few people, but they can't keep track of what everyone is doing everywhere, and even if they can, they can't suppress every place. So what we've done now is that we have thousands, tens of thousands of people who have gotten uh, trained to do this, and if you go to our website, there's a, an app. There are two apps. One is an app that trains people to be able to do the meditation and access consciousness in such a way that they can remote view uh, where ET craft or peoples or planets are, and then in a diplomatic fashion, invite them to make contact. Uh, and also all the other associated protocols using lasers and tones and electronic systems. That's a training tool 
that you can get at our website at uh, disclo- uh, seriousdisclosure.com. There's also a free app so that if you understand what I'm talking about and want to connect with someone in your region, you can get a free app to put on your iPhone or um, Android. We don't have it. We just have it for those two platforms. And you can uh, download this app and see who is in your area. And you can then contact that person and say, hey, you want to go out on, you know, Thursday night, it's going to be nice weather, and use these protocols and see if we can make contact. It's great because we now have thousands of people who have this free app who are in every continent on the planet now, I mean literally every continent, virtually every country, who are now able to connect with each other. So this is a fantastic way. We never had a way before to kind of network everyone together. So this is sort of a social networking uh, app that anyone can get and download for free. And what it does, it, it doesn't do anything except show you who in your area is also on that app. It doesn't, it, it doesn't have a chat feature. So people either have to put in uh, their email or get a special email address so people can contact each other. Um, it's a very simple app at this point because someone who developed it did it in their spare time, and, and this person is a very, very busy tech fellow. But um, it's great because it's enabled people all over the world to find who else is interested in not only disclosure and what we're doing with uh, all the research, but also to, to connect with folks who want to go out there uh, and use these protocols. And, and this is really the heart of what I tell people it, uh, of, of how the people can take this matter into their own hands. Because, you know, millions of thousands and then eventually millions of people understanding this and doing it would completely overwhelm the ability of suppression. And that is something that, that I mean, when people realize that not only does it work, but it's easy, it's not that difficult to do. Um, and if they actually do it with a, frankly, just a, a clear intention and a pure heart, uh, without any prejudice and expectations, you, they'll be very surprised at the extraordinary things that begin to happen that are the real ET stuff. Um, so I think that's the, the, that's the most exciting part of what's happened in the last couple months is that we've been able to get this app up so that people who understand these concepts can connect with each other. And um, the training app is, is a separate one from this networking app, but that the training app actually... It's a huge training. I mean, it literally goes through a whole remote viewing training course. It goes through all the protocols. It goes how to set up your own contact team. And um, that's a wonderful app that someone developed a couple years for us. But uh, the people who were getting that app had no way to connect with anyone else in their area. Say, they, you know, you live in Iowa. Well, you know, how do you find anyone else in Iowa to do this with? So now they can do this with this free app. Well, uh, you know, it sounds like a great application. This whole wanting to know for alone in the universe is basically a worldwide uh, community, and people want to share their stories and their experiences. And what better place to do it on our location? Trying to uh, make contact. It sounds incredible. And people always say, right here at Third Phase Moon, is how, uh, all these videos. I, these videos are great, but I've never seen one for myself. And basically, these well, they're just not looking up in the sky. We're what, going to break right now? We'll be uh, right back with Third Phase of the Moon. We are here with Dr. Stephen Greer, back by popular demand. Right before Blake, right before the break, For Blake Cousins minutes, was speaking about the technology. He was about to get a question, and I'm going to go ahead and let Blake go ahead and finish that thought so and that question. Go ahead, Blake. What's going on with oh, this certainly. Uh, and yeah, and Dr. Greer's app on sounds Dr. Daniel like Daniel an incredible idea. social way of getting together with your friends wherever you are around the world and go on these incredible basically UFO hunts or make contact, more importantly. But some of the people that were, people say when we're making contact with these things that they're, they could be like demons or Satan. Uh, that, to me, that's pretty uh, ludicrous when people say that, but you never know. People are changing the stories all the time, even when it comes to alien abductions. Now they're kind of retracting their alien abduction scenario and saying that they were abducted by uh, dark government agencies posing as aliens, kind of what you've been saying about this false flag thing, uh, Dr. Greer. Can you tell us about this false flag? Flag and what's your thought? Do aliens abduct people, or is it basically us, just Day, a black did, uh, government Stan operation Freeman, doing this? Uh, say about some of these well, there's a whole bunch uh, of different kinds of ships visiting Earth, you know, and some uh, of the other sizes that are out together. there. 
Uh, remember, uh, if you have something that you really can't control, the intelligence community always tries to hide it in plain sight. I'm quoting from a guy that I met with many years ago who worked in the intelligence community. And what does that mean? It means that he tried to cover up the actual events with a bunch of bogus stuff. Um, not that it's not actually happening to people, but that it's there in the country. People have to beg this up a little bit. Since, 19, since October of 1954, classified projects in the aerospace sector, my uncle worked on the lunar module, the first man on the moon, out of the north of Grumman. That industry and the intelligence community figured out how to control gravity, basically how these UFOs operate in October 1954. That means that there have been Absolutely, whatever is uh, stocking the space station here, been we're not exactly sure what it is. And if you think you have an idea, leave your comments below and you know, share your ideas of what's that happening many in this incredible video shot from the ISS. And people, the UFO hunters Once out there like Toby Lynn, that uh, captured, not captured, but uh, noticed this anomaly, uh, sharing it with us at Third Phase Moon, that's what we want to see. And the best way to do that is either Twitter, Facebook, Skype, uh, you know, subscribe on YouTube, Third Phase Moon, there were people share it with us, share it with the world. My name is Blake Cousins, everybody stand by for more uh, breaking news coming in soon. The earliest recorded civilizations have had contact with civilizations, with so-called star people. However, the modern era of uh, so-called abductions and other events began to be put into place as a cover story to the actual events. And this gets to be very complicated. Now, what most people can't imagine is that there has been a, a, a parallel development in biological systems and technologies to these electromagnetic systems. And so beginning way back in the 60s, 70s, they began to do things that were related. I have a document from the Strategic Studies Institute that describes the covert uh, abduction program done by quasi-military, paramilitary, covert, unacknowledged special access projects to create the specter of fear using advanced uh, aerospace objects and creatures that look like, quote-unquote, aliens. So one of the problems is Everyone thinks that anything that goes bump in the night is ET, and it is not. It's unfortunately been deliberately confused, obfuscated, uh, and, and frankly, that's how they've covered this up. And if you go to your standard you know, UFO site or conference, a great deal of the information is information that is, in many cases, being unwittingly passed on to the public as an ET event when it is not. Now, if I hadn't personally met with a number of, of men who had run those operations where they described to me both the technologies and the purpose behind it, I wouldn't have believed it because the truth is, frankly, more bizarre than the fiction that most people think is true. And this creates this whole problem of that, look, if Werner von Braun, who invented the rocket for Adolf Hitler, was correct on his deathbed when he said, look, they are going to try to create a false alien threat to unite the world around at some point, and that that program started in the 50s and 60s and is continuing. So, and in fact, uh, he stated that you know we'd have the Cold War and then we'd have global uh, terrorism and then there'd be uh, asteroid fears and then the big, big card that they're holding back is a false flag uh, threat from the quote unquote aliens. Now, you know, that's why I'm very skeptical about 99% about of the material out there because having personally met with so many of these folks who've been in uh, these agencies and, and corporations that have been up to this kind of skullduggery and nonsense, uh, I think it's so easy to overwhelm a, an unfunded research community in the UFO sector uh, and, and purvey this, this, this sort of uh, experience. Now, it's not to say that people haven't been victimized. They have. Or that people haven't had contact with ETs where it startled them or they may not have understood what was going on. But there's a whole lot of confusion on the subject, but that confusion has been deliberate. It's sort of like when we went into Iraq and broke their whole oil system so that Saddam Hussein couldn't start pumping oil onto the free market because Russia and France and the U.N. were going to lift the sanctions. Well, gee, what a great way to make oil go from $35 a barrel up to $150 a barrel, which is what it did. 
Now, the same thing is true in terms of information and data systems in the intelligence community. And contrary to what people think, these guys, they may be evil as all get out, but they're, they're, not, they're, they're quite capable at creating this kind of false information and false flag. And the, the result is that most people run around like chickens with their heads cut off, terrified of all things E.T., when in reality, it's not the ETs you need to be worried about. It's the classified projects that are using uh, what are called alien reproduction vehicles, ARVs, that are man-made UFOs with these uh, biological nanotechnology creatures that have integrated circuits in their brains and uh, people using this so-called stagecraft. And I'm quoting from the document uh, from the Strategic Studies Institute that said that, that you know, we use stagecraft to create this abduction f- fear of aliens so that eventually people will accept the cost of going to some kind of, of battle with, with ETs. Now, of course, who would benefit from this? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? Except all these, I mean, look at the, the one of the central organizing uh, principles of our society for thousands of years has been warfare. And, you know, as Leon Panetta, the CIA director, said a few years ago, a former CIA director, uh, he said, look, you know, we're spending $110 billion a year to chase down 70 al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. So at, at a certain point, you simply have got to create a new enemy to justify a multi-trillion dollar military, industrial, laboratory uh, complex, which, when, you know, because it's very hard to, to justify those kind of expenditures uh, without there being some really large threat out there. And I think this is where I think we're very vulnerable, is that people are vulnerable to wanting to be scared, uh, and they fear kind of galvanizes people like it did after 9-11 much more than uh, love or peace or intelligence or rational thinking. So unfortunately, the human species is very vulnerable to this kind of demagogic uh, manipulation, and I think that that's why we have to be very, very careful. And this is one of the central principles of what we call the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, where we train people to go out and make contact, is to do so leaving all those prejudices and stories behind. Because while you need to be aware of the covert capabilities, you need to also be aware that the likelihood that these other civilizations have some kind of hostile intent towards us is very, very small. Because if they did have that hostile intent, I think it would have been exercised in full view around the time we developed uh, uh, thermonuclear weapons and going into space. And I think this is one of the problems is is that we need people with calmer minds and, and I think a more spiritual uh, uh, sort of orientation towards the human future so we don't go into this sort of of end-of-the-world mania that they would like us to go into with some kind of concocted threat from outer space. And I think to do that, there's a couple ways to do it. One is that people get together and and make contact themselves. And, you know, I've been doing this for 24 years with groups of people all over the world. We've never had anything frightening happen to us from the ETs, although we've had plenty of terrible you know, bizarre things happen at the hands of the intelligence community. So, you know, I tell people, you know, it's your human, fellow humans you've got to be concerned about, not the ETs. But uh, the other point I make is that even if there were species out there that may not have our best interests in mind, and I don't believe there are, but let's say there were, well, the approach is not going to be using very advanced weapon systems to blow up both planets. It's going to have people go out there and make contact and create a dialogue. So any way you look at it, that's the rational approach, and that's the approach for what I call the creation of a future that involves not just world peace but universal peace because there can't be world peace without universal peace because we're not alone in the universe. So we're going to have to really begin to look at this in a very much larger way than the, the way it has, has been and go beyond just the ephemera, the sort of the passing phenomenon and the, the stories that people tell and begin to ask the question, what is actually causing all this and, and who's behind it? Um, and I think people are going to be surprised if they drill down on that question to see that there's a great deal of um, interest in the intelligence and in certain uh, corporate sectors uh, to, to deceive the public on this. And that's why it's ultimately the way that you get clarity on it 
is you do the research, but also you go out and make the contact directly and find out for yourself. And the experiences, we were just actually up in the mountains of Arizona a couple weeks ago doing a whole week uh, expedition. We had an incredible team of people. And we had the most beautiful experiences, not only in consciousness, but in objects that appeared, a phenomenon that happened all around us in the field. I mean, it's like something out of a movie. And, uh, you know, the people who were there, I think they couldn't even believe what happened. And this happens every time we go out uh, on one of these expeditions. What I like to hear is that people learn to do that on their own. You know, we recently heard from a guy who was a truck driver in Eastern Europe who was practicing these protocols when he was pulled over late at night resting, and a craft came over, and he had this amazing contact experience and sighting that was both in consciousness but also visually. Um, and it was just an everyday guy who was a truck driver, and I think it was Croatia, or I'm not really sure which country it was. But um, this is happening all over the world, and it's phenomenal. And I tell people that that's something that um, we can take matters in our own hands. I tell people, you know, instead of, you know, sitting in front of the idiot box and, uh, and in front of your computer all night, put that stuff away, go out, learn how to do these protocols, and look up at the stars and begin to invite these civilizations to make peaceful contact. And you might be very surprised what you'll see and what will happen. Uh, so I think that's one thing that's incredibly empowering that you don't need the approval of the President of the United States for. Um, although, it's, uh, comically, the, the head of Army Intelligence said, who, what gives you the right to be doing this? You don't have permission. I said, yeah, I do. I said, I have permission from the ETs, and I have permission from my own conscience, and you don't have jurisdiction over space. So, uh, you know, anyway. You know, I, I, people need to begin to realize that we need to organize ourselves around making these changes happen, whether it's, uh, you know, contact or... Uh, disclosing this information or bringing out the technologies that we need to get this planet off of the the uh, death spiral of fossil fuels and coal and oil. You know, we have about a little over eight minutes left, so this is going to be a double multifaceted question. Speaking of what sure. you just did in in Arizona, you're going to actually be doing the same thing in California at Contact in the Desert, which we're, we're doing an exclusive contest here, giving one ticket a week away every week starting June, uh, and everybody – May be attend at the event and attend Dr. Greer's uh, CE5. I was there last year and it was truly a phenomenal event. So that's one thing I wanted to say. If you want to talk a little bit about that, but secondly, when I saw the serious disclosure, uh, the serious documentary at the premiere, a good friend said right after, it's not so much about them hiding the extraterrestrials from us that it is so much more about the technology. Because once the technology empire collapses, then I think everything will collapse. And to make that happen, you've actually initiated the Star Challenge, right? Yeah, we have. If you go to uh, SiriusDisclosure.com, S-I-R-I-U-S Disclosure.com, we have a $100,000 challenge and award for anyone who can develop one of these uh, so-called free energy devices or zero-point energy devices. We haven't raised the funds to open our own research lab, which is what we ultimately would like to do. But if somebody has something out there that's open source, meaning it's not secret and it can be transparently, openly tested and reproduced, um, we have $100,000 that thanks to the public and that's a thanks to all of you for your donations that we can provide to someone who brings that forward that meet our criteria, and the criteria are very explicit and are also on our website. But yeah, We just announced that about a month ago. So anyone that uh, thinks that they have such a, a system, they should contact us as soon as possible. Um, there are many things out there on YouTube and the Internet that claim this, but we've spent about $950,000 over the last 15 years going around the world, and many of those are mismeasurements or have been things that have been, frankly, tricks that have been trying to defraud people out of money. And so what we, we're doing now is saying, look, if you have this and it's legitimate, it should be able to be tested very transparently and independently and reproduced independently, which is the sine qua non of science. And there is a $100,000 award for anyone who can bring us something like that. And those, those funds are available, and we invite anyone who has such a thing to come forward. The other thing about what we're going to be doing at Joshua Tree, I want to point out, I'm, I'm giving a lecture, sort of the keynote on Sunday, but that night after the formal conference is over, if people want to come out under the stars with us uh, for, for that night, um, they can go to SeriousDisclosure.com. There's a, 
a, a, a workshop or a, a field expedition uh, that we're doing that you referred to. We did it last year for the first time. It had four or 500 people there. It was amazing. And we're going to do it again this year on August 10th, which is that Sunday night. And then for a very small group of people who, who want to spend the whole week with us, it's limited to 25 people, um, we're going to do an entire week out in Joshua Tree and uh, go up during the day to this beautiful shaman cave we found up there uh, and do meditation and, and initiation into remote viewing uh, up in Joshua Tree National Park. But on the retreat center grounds is about four or 500 acres where we'll be out at night, and there, that's where we're going to have an advanced training for an entire week for people who, who want to join us for that. So information on both of those are at the website, uh, SeriousDisclosure.com. We've got about four minutes left. I want to give Blake the uh, final question, and then, of course, Dr. Greer, any final thoughts? So go ahead, Blake. Thanks, Dr. Jay. Basically, uh, this uh, contest or reward, a uh, $100,000 reward for uh, the free energy, uh, any proof, do they basically, if they have the machine, are they basically just proving to you that, he, hey, look, we could do this free energy, or are you looking to uh, buy rights to the machine and then license it out? How does that work? No, 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 no to all that. It has to be open source. Open source means it cannot be patented. You don't need rights. Our intention is to it should be put out to the public for everyone to have. Now, it's a heavy industry. It's not like an app uh, that you can do for free and people download it. You have to manufacture these things. So eventually you'd have to stand it up, but it can still be done as an open source technology. We do not believe patenting will work because every patent dealing with this has been seized in the past. If it's done as a secret, that's why people like Stan Meyer and Nikola Tesla took all this stuff to their grave. You cannot keep it secret. Our objective would be to uh, actually take physical possession of the device, reproduce it once it's been proven by three different laboratories that it is a legitimate system that is over unity, creating more energy than we have to put in because it's accessing the zero-point energy field. It will then be fully disclosed to the public, and then we will move to the next level where we try to make it so it can be go straight into to, uh, further development for a, a practical system that would run your home or your car. Um, that obviously is a, is a heavy industry. It's not like, a, as I said, a software app. You've really got to put some resources into that. But frankly, we have people who, if we can prove the science, would be able to do that. And we are not accepting anything that requires secrecy or requires a patent because we've gone that route and it never works. Um, and the explanation for this, by the way, we have just done a four-hour workshop in Washington that's up, uh, uh, you can see a link to it from SeriousDisclosure.com, uh, where I go into the whole history of these free energy devices, how they've been suppressed, and what the strategy is to get them out to the public so we can fix the world's environment and, and eliminate poverty on this planet once and for all. But I think that um, to do this, you can't, if you don't learn from the past, you're going to repeat those mistakes. So here's the mistake we cannot repeat. It cannot be secret, and it cannot be um, patented, and it needs to be, if it is legitimate, it needs to be made available on the Internet to everyone. Now, there are things like that out there now that people say fit this, and what I'm saying is that, well, then go and build one and bring it here to Virginia, and we'll test it. Um, so far, no one has has done that, and if they do, and it meets the criteria, which are very explicit on our website, they will collect the $100,000 award. And that is truly something that will be changing the world. Uh, we do got oh, a couple yeah. minutes left. I, we know you're going to be speaking around the world and conducting these CE5 uh, workshops, teaching people how to become CE5 ambassadors. What else are you going to be doing in the near future, and what, what would you like to tell the listeners before we get off air? The one final statement from you. We've got about two well, minutes. Well, you know, really this is all about networking, and, and people can sign up uh, for our newsletters and information on our website. There's a free uh, email uh, newsletter that we put out every week or two, um, and anyone who wants to can sign up for that. Like I said, you can get the app and connect with people in your own community to become a, a CE5 contact team member. Um, you can just spread the word and help network for us. Um, you can contribute. There's a way to donate to what we're doing. It's on our website. And the other thing that everyone can do is, uh, you know, really 
work towards ending the secrecy on this by telling other people about this and networking it to people in a wise fashion. We have um, the disclosure book and also the videos of all these top secret people's testimony that can be provided to people who are just looking into this and are very, very skeptical. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really the gold standard of information on this, and that's also available through our website. Um, and I think that's, those are all things anyone can do. And in the future, I'm just going to mention this, we're working on a two new documentaries. One would be on the Atacama uh, mystery, and the other uh, would be on the deep knowledge behind trans-dimensional physics and the science of consciousness and how that interfaces with extraterrestrial electromagnetic communication systems and why the CE5 contact protocols work. Um, we also have just finished the screenplay for a full-length feature film uh, that a New York Times best-selling author and a guy who's done screenplays did as a volunteer. It just got finished a couple weeks ago. So I've been meeting with a lot of people to talk about doing a, a, a big movie that would be based on true information on this something this subject instead of on science fiction. And we're, we'll see where that goes. So if anyone's a um, uh, top-tier uh, filmmaker who wants to get involved with that, they should contact us. Um, and so those are all things that are in development in the last uh, three or four months. It's really been, it's really been amazing. Like, um,